want to make a uh, simple announcement here, and then we're going to get started. Uh, Bentley, hey, how you doing, buddy? You got Miss Terry all by yourself today. How about that? Aren't you privileged? Um, our business meeting today, I don't think we mentioned that. Uh, we do have our business meeting today, and uh, it was rescheduled from last week because we had visitors. Uh, so please join us for that if you can. A lot of things that uh, I want to discuss with you and share with you and some uh, things that we need to pray for so that we can further grow this church in our community. So with that, let's go ahead and pray it up, and we'll dismiss Mr. Bentley with uh, Miss Terry, okay? Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word, Lord. We ask you to bless our hearts, our souls, our spirits by opening them up to receive your word today. Father, we ask you to bless our offerings that were given today and that are going to be given today. Not only our, our uh, monetary offers, but also our, our, uh, our, our faith and our hearts and our attentiveness to your word, Lord. Lord, ask, I ask you to continue blessing our government. Watch over our government. We pray for our administration that is put over us, and we ask, Lord, that you straighten them out. Lord, we do thank you for this rain. We need this rain desperately. This area needs the rain, and so do many other areas. So, Father, we just ask that you uh, save our nation, provide all that we need, keep us in your, in your arms, keep us in your hands, continue loving us, and guide us and direct us to love you more and more and more each every day, and every day. Use us, Lord, for your favor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and dismiss Mr. Bentley. <laughs> Clark, you can't go. Okay? <laughs> I'm just kidding with you, brother. You know that. He started to get up. <laughs> All right, we're going to be, uh, I think it's on the screen. Yeah, the Gospel of John. We're going to finish this up today, the Lord's Prayer. Um, you know, you might think, oh, well, there's only a few verses. Well, if you know me, then... Uh, you know, we can talk about, uh, I've lost my, we can talk about one verse. Uh, we did a uh, RCC Bible study TV, which is 30, roughly 28 and a half minutes long. We did half of one verse, one, uh, one uh, a recording. But uh, there's a lot to be said about God's word. It's, it's ever evolving. It's ever informative. It's ever uh, trying to touch and reach us so that we will come to the better understanding of the love that God has for us through his son, Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to talk about the Lord's Prayer today, finish it up. Uh, many of us know, of course, over in Matthew and Luke, whenever Jesus says, this is how you should pray, we call that the Lord's Prayer. And that's okay. You can call it the Lord's Prayer. But Jesus says, this is how you should pray. So you actually have to break that down to understand uh, how you should pray, how your prayers, if you will, should be constructed. However, the true Lord's Prayer, which is chapter 17 of the Gospel of John, is what we have been studying, and we're going to finish it up today. We're going to find out today that Jesus prays for you and me. He is praying for you and me and for all who would become believers throughout the church age. The church age is when Jesus ascended into heaven until Jesus comes back and calls his church home. That's the church age. That's what we're in. It may be 100 years. It may be 1,000 years. It may be 10,000 years. It may be 100 million years. We don't know. But at some point in time, Christ is going to come back, and we're going to hear the trumpet of the archangel, and he is going to sound his trumpet, and all those who are dead in Christ will be risen, and all those who are in Christ will meet them in the air to meet with Jesus. That is the rapture. That is what Jesus promises, and that's what we believe. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. amen. There you go. All right, so chapter 17, the Gospel of John, starting at verse 20. <clears throat> I do not pray for these alone. Now, he has been praying for his disciples, okay? Back uh, 6 through 19, he's praying for his disciples, his apostles. We talked about that the last couple of weeks. Now he is praying for us. For you specifically and for me specifically. He says, I do not pray for these alone, his, his disciples, his apostles, but all for those who will, get this now, who will believe in me through their word. Who will believe in me through their word. Whose words? Through the apostles and the disciples' words. 
because he called those 12, of, ended up 11 and then 12 again, but he called those apostles to preach the gospel of Christ and to write down, to write down the words of God and the meanings of God and the ordinances of God and the laws of God and the commands of God and on and on and on and on. And therefore, out of that, we get the New Testament, the New Testament. Now, every one of the disciples and, and uh, uh, people who wrote the New Testament were not necessarily followers of Christ when Christ was here, such as in the book of James. The book of James, that's Jesus' brother. Jesus' uh, brother did not come a disciple until afterwards. He ended up being head of the church of Israel. Jude, another one of Jesus' brothers, did not become a disciple until after Jesus' ascension. All the, the writers of the New Testament were Jews with the exception of one, and that was Luke. Luke was a Gentile. Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, and he wrote the book of Acts. All the rest of the people that, were, that wrote the New Testament were of Jewish descent and were Jews, converted into Christianity. Short on breath this morning for some reason. But we have to understand that they wrote down what God told them, inspired by God, remember, over in uh, Peter, inspired by God, the writings that you now have today, which is the New Testament. God gave it to them to sit down and write it down. And so God even used a Greek or Gentile, if you will, which was Luke, which is what we are, Greek or Gentile, means the same thing. He used him, and he will use us to further his ministry. Jesus prayed not only for his disciples and his apostles, but also for all who would come to believe. Throughout history, from their preaching and their writings, which is the New Testament that we have. It has been written down because it was inspired by God for them to write it down as love letters to each and every one of us from God. Not from the disciples, but from God. <clears throat> Paul, as you know, wrote most of the New Testament, and he was an apostle after, after Christ ascended. He became an apostle because he had a personal encounter with Christ face-to-face, one-on-one, -on, -one, on the road to Damascus. We know the story, I hope. <clears throat> so what is the teaching of the New Testament writings? What is the message of the New Testament? Now, this is in a nutshell, if you will. It is our unity, our unity with Christ. That's why Jesus came. Jesus came to unify his disciples, his apostles, with him for God's purpose. It's the same way he came for us or has called us to be in unity with him, with Christ not on our own. It's not because we're great, great people, though you are. It's not because you're special, though you are. Christ died for you. That makes you pretty special, right? Sure it does. But he, he came to make, to have unity with you and me. <clears throat> it is our unity with Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit that makes known to the world the love of God. And when and whoever believes in the truths of God's word, they become one with Christ and one in Christ, sharing his life and becoming a part of his church, becoming a part of his church, which is the body of believers, which is you and I. Thus glorifying God through our unity, through our unity with our triune God. Our triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That's the purpose of the New Testament. That's the purpose that Jesus came for, is to bring us into unification with God. How special is that? And it is available to all who shall believe. Not that we are gods, now because there's the bicycle guys that walk around knocking on doors in the white shirts and ties that says, oh, you become a god. Well, actually, 
really and truly, Scripture says, little g-gods, we are gods over this earth. Little g-gods. But we will never be God because there is one God, the Father. There is one God, the Son. There is one God, the Holy Spirit. And the three of them make the triune God that we believe in. <clears throat> They're all the same. Well, how can they be the same if they're different? Well, just as we are the same, but we're different. Carol and I are certainly not the same, but we are the same. We're children of God. And we, we worship our risen Lord through the power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us to the glory of God the Father. So we are one, even though we're totally different. You and I are one. Chris and I are different, totally different. He sings, I don't. We're different. He preaches, I preach. We're the same. Now, I know y'all love baseball as much as I do. I didn't get to watch the whole game because I have many things I have to do. But yesterday... History was made, if you believe it or not, in baseball. The Houston Astros played the Seattle Mariners last night. All the way up until the 18th inning. Okay? That is two games in one. All the way up to the 18th inning when our shortstop of the Houston Astros hit a home run, Pena, hit a home run in center field, there was not a score made. History was made all the way through. No game in the history of baseball has ever gone that long without a score. History was made. I know that's very important to y'all. I saw everybody writing those notes down. Wow! It was an awesome game. It lasted about seven hours. I didn't get to see it all because I had work to do. But it was an awesome game. As a matter of fact, it was supposed to preempt the Yankees and uh, Cleveland game, all right, on the same channel. When the game was finally over, over on the next channel, whichever it was, the Yankees and Cleveland finished up, and they were in the eighth inning Whenever the game between Houston and the uh, and Seattle ended, it was a, uh, you got to understand baseball. And I know y'all love baseball, so I'm just sharing it with you because I was excited the whole game. Wait a minute, 18 innings and it's one, one score and you were excited? You better believe it. You better believe it. It was a pitching duel like you have never seen. Those pitchers fanned those batters, every one of them just boom, 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 boom. And it was amazing to me, all right? Of course, I'm a baseball fan. Okay, yeah, I know you think it's enough, right? Not quite. Not quite. And the reason being is because, remember I said Chris and I are the same, but we're different? On a baseball team, and you can use football if you really know anything or think about football ever. You can use football in the same scenario. On a baseball team, there are nine players in the field. Can the pitcher pitch and run behind the batter and catch the ball? No, he can't. Can a fielder, outfielder, ground, uh, receive a grounder and run to first base and get the guy out by himself? No, he can't. Why? Because it takes a team. It takes a team that are totally different, doing different jobs, but serving the same purpose, which is to win the game. Which is to win the game. That's what you and I are called to do. Carolyn's called to play her position. Kathy's called to play her position. Mike's called to play his position. Johnny's called to play his position. I'm called to play my position, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what is our end goal? Our end goal is to win the game. What is winning the game? The winning the game is winning souls for Christ. We're a team, folks. We have to be a team. Our Trail Life team, our American Heritage Girl team are dynamite. Dynamite. And we need more people on those teams. 
But they are doing a fantastic job. But it takes team effort. It's just like our service to God. It takes team effort. It takes each and every one of us playing our role or doing our role or doing our job or however you want to look at it in to make the team work. The teamwork makes the dream work. Teamwork makes the dream work. And the dream of God is that none shall perish. None shall perish. So you need to be a part of the team. An active part of the team. Oh, well, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Check with me. I'll hook you up. You'll be preaching next week. Oh, no. We have to understand that we have to participate. We have to be a part of the ministry of Jesus Christ, which is to come and save the lost souls of Israel. Now, we say that, we know that Jesus came to the lost souls. We're going to see this in just a little bit. He came to, to save Israel, the lost souls of Israel. However, they denied Jesus Christ, so therefore God hardened their hearts in order to allow us to come in. Why? To make them jealous. Do you think that Seattle last night was envious of Houston winning the game? Man, they hung their dog heads down and, and put their tw tail between their legs and went home. They said they're watching the, the other team just celebrate and have a great time. And it's like, yeah. How many, how many runs does it take to win a game? One. I used to ask my, when I coached baseball, I used to I always ask my team that at the first of every season. Say, how many games does it, I mean, how many runs does it take to win a game? Oh, 10, 20, 100, 5, takes one, one, and you're that one. You're the run. You're the home run. You're the winning walk-off home run. But you got to play the game. You got to play the game. And it's a fun game. It's not an easy game. 18 innings. You think that was easy? They were saying, they, this is crazy. Seattle went through their entire lineup of pitchers and started in the 18th inning with their beginning pitcher that started the game. You think those guys weren't wore out? Sure they were. The commentator even says, even the batters are tired. It was a fantastic game. But my point is simply this. God has a fantastic game that you can be a part of and you can play in. But you got to play. You got to step up. You got to get the bat. And you got to swing it. And maybe you'll hit that home run by winning one soul to Christ. That's what your calling is, friend. A seven-hour game. The longest I've ever sat through is 16 hours. And then me and Terry's uncle went to bed after that. It was like, this went to like 2 or 3 in the morning. And we sat there and we said, man, I'm sorry. I'm going to go visit Terry. You go visit uh, her aunt. And we're going to sleep. But this game went 18 innings. Two games. It was, it was an awesome game. Wish I'd have seen it all. Um, Football can kind of work the same thing, I guess, if you like football. But our unity together will make a difference. But our unity together, our unity together has to be the unity with Christ. It has to be for the same purpose that Christ came, which is to save souls. Now, you don't save souls. I don't save souls. Jesus saves. But you and I are here to introduce God's love to the different souls that are lost. What is our goal? The same as Christ was. I shared with you last week. Christ's goal was to come and make known to the world God. To make known to the world God. What is your ministry? To make known to the world God. Well, how am I going to do that? By following Jesus, that's how. By following Jesus. Verse 22. 
Oh, that was uh, supposed to be verse 20 and 21. Sorry. I'll read verse 21. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us and that the world may believe that you sent me. See, through you and I being one, being united with Christ, that shows the world, man, only God could have done that, uh, you know, with Woody. No, nobody in the whole world could save Woody but, but God. I'm going to use this real quick. I, I smoked for 43 years. I've told you all that several, several times. I never wanted to quit, didn't want to quit, argue with God, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. My kids came to me and said, please, 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 quit, quit, quit. Wouldn't quit. I saw the black lungs, you know, this, that, and the other. Please, I saw people die of cancer, lung cancer, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, please, please, quit. It didn't affect me one bit, right? Not one bit. Until God, until God got a hold of me. That night, going to Bible study. That night, God changes lives. You don't change your life. God changes your life. You just think you're in charge until you meet the man who is in charge. Verse 22, and the glory which you gave me, Jesus is speaking, of course, I have given them that they may be one just as we are when one. We are unified with the Father to love as he loves with the Son to carry the message of God's love and we can do it only with the power of the Holy Spirit which will live in us see we have that power that lives in us in order to go out and share the love of God with others I'm not going to mention any names like Margot and a couple of the others that that uh, said oh well I can't speak in front of people well I can't pray in front of people well I can't do this and that and the other in front of people until God gets a hold of you. And then he can change you from what you thought you could never be to something that will glorify him. I mean, I'm a perfect example of that. I'm not saying I'm perfect, certainly not, but I'm a perfect example of that. From a dirt bag to one who leads a church, if you will. No glory of mine, all glory goes to God. And this is what God can do for you. Oh, you mean he wants to, I, I, I can lead the church? Well, I don't want to lead the church. Well, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, is God can take you from the, the depths of hell, if you will, and bring you to the glory of the Father. He can do that. And it will surprise the bejesus out of you. It's unbelievable what he can do. It'd be unbelievable what you can do through him or with him if you allow it to happen. Verse 23, I and them and you and me, and they are made perfect in one. They are made perfect in one. In one, in not in, in, it's not saying that I'm perfect. It's not saying that John's perfect. It's not saying that Johnny's perfect. It's not saying that George is perfect. It's not saying you ladies are perfect. What it's saying is in Christ and with Christ, we are made perfect in our being, which is our spirit being, which is the true us. We are perfected. We are sinless. We have no sin in our spirit. We still have a soul. We still have a body that needs a lot of work. And we have to battle those battles. But we have Christ in us and the power of the Holy Spirit that raised the dead, a power of the Holy Spirit living on us to enable us to do God's bidding for our lives. There's nothing that can stop us. I love the scripture. It says, what can man do to me? If God is for me, who can be against me? Nobody. I don't worry about anything, no matter what, whatsoever, because God's got it in my book. I know that's an easy way to say it, and it may be a cliche, but I believe that. I trust fully, 100% in all the works that God has for me to do, because he's going to do it by using me, because I submit to him. It's just that simple. We are made perfect in our spirit by his truth, not our truth, by his truth, because God is perfect. God is perfect. Our unity is not trivial. 
and should never be taken lightly. Your salvation, your unity with God, your, your uh, uh, brotherhood, your, uh, um, what is the word that I'm looking for? You're, in, you're enjoined with God. You should never take that lightly. Oh, yeah, I know God's, God's with me. I know he sees everything, but, you know, he'll forgive me, so I'll just do whatever I want to do. No. Do you realize every time, and I, I don't mean to point fingers or anything like this or make you feel bad about anything, but do you realize, the Scripture says, every time you sin, you crucify Christ again? Every time you knowingly sin, you knowingly sin. Oh, I know I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to do it anyway just because I want to. You crucify Christ again. Over in James 4 and 17, it says, if you know that you should not do, paraphrase, you know you should not do a particular thing. God has put it on your heart not to do a, a particular thing. And you do it anyway, it is a sin to you. It is a sin. Now, none of us are perfect. I hope we all understand that. And we know that we're going to mess up. We know we're going to backslide. But that's not an excuse to habitually do it. See, there's a difference. To habitually... <laughs> Thank you. That, live a life of sin, habitually live a life of sin, you're crucifying Christ all over again. You're slandering the blood of Jesus. You're mocking his death on the cross. You're displeasing the Father. And that is the fear of God. Not the fear that he's going to go when you're gone, but the fear that you're going to hurt his heart. To hurt his heart. Jesus was obedient to death on the cross. We should be obedient to the death on the cross. Though we don't have to suffer because he did. God uses us, his believers, his children, to make himself known just as he used Christ to show the world, the watching world, his eternal love. The watching world. All of Israel... All of the Romans, they watched, they looked at Christ. Even the Jews looked at Christ. Who, who is this man? I love the scripture where Jesus was on the boat and he stood up and he calmed the storm. And the guy says, his disciples stood up and says, who is this guy? Who can calm the sea and tell the wind to be still? Well, the world will look at you at the same thing and go, who is this guy that brings the message of the cross? I know you from way back. And you certainly were not not um, qualified. But remember, God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. So can he use you? Yes, yes, you bet he can. You bet he can. And when he uses us for his glorious purpose. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting at verse 4. First Corinthians 12, starting at verse 4. Now, Paul is writing to the church of Corinth here, and he simply tells him, look, there's different pickles in the barrel. You're one pickle, I'm another pickle, but we're still pickles. All right? He says, there are, different, uh, there are differences in ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities in, of activities, but the same God, who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. In other words, Johnny has one ministry or one uh, ability to do, and I have another. Uh, Brother Billy has one, I have a different one. Uh, Brother um, uh, Chris has one, I have another. And not to leave you ladies out, uh, Brother Bar uh, Sister Barbara has one, I have another. Sister Kathy has one, I have another. Sister Carolyn has one, I have another. We're all different. But we all belong to the same pickle barrel. 
We all belong to the same barrel. <clears throat> For one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to the other the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith through the same Spirit, to another gifts and healings of the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to other and to other prophets, to another prophecy, to another discerning spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretations of tongues. In other words, and you could go on and on and on and on. He gives us all different things that we're to do for his glory. But we're all on the same team. It doesn't matter if you're a right fielder, center fielder, left fielder, third base, shortstop, second base, first base, pitcher, catcher. You're still on the same team. You can be the bat boy. You're still on the same team. But one and the same, verse 11, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing each of them individually as he wills, not as you will. Oh, well, I'm going to be like Woody and be up there and preach. Not unless God has called you to do it. Barry and I have talked a couple of times about being teachers of the Word. You're, hold, you're, held, hold, you're held to a higher standard a very high standard. Why? Because you have the spiritual wellness of everybody at your disposal, if you will. And if you don't do it the way God wants it done, you better watch out, Clyde, because it won't be a good day in your neighborhood. Verse 12. For as the body is one, and as many members, but all are members of one body, being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. That's the church. That's the body of believers. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and all have been made to drink of one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. So Paul is telling us right there that there's many different avenues to glorify God with your life. Many different ways to glorify God with your life. The question is, is are you using what God has given you? I hope so. Let's go to Ephesians, Ephesians 4, or 2, I'm sorry, Ephesians 2, verse 14. Ephesians 2, it's just uh, three books over, two bo three books over. Ephesians 4, <laughs> Ephesians 2, <laughs> I'm trying to get my head straight. Ephesians 2, please, verses 14 through 22. <clears throat> For he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh, his sacrifice, the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in oracles, so as to create himself one new man from two, thus making peace. In other words, he is talking about being under the law, which are the Jews, or being under grace, which are Christians. He is now saying that we are under grace through the blood of Jesus. Everyone, including the Jews. <clears throat> and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, which was his own body. Therefore, putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. Those who were far off were the Greek or the Gentiles, the non-believers. The ones who were near were the Jews, God's chosen people. <clears throat> For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers or foreigners, but fellow citizens and saints with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. You could say the disciples and the apostles, which is exactly what we're talking about. In other words, the writings and the preaching of the apostles and the disciples, which we shared earlier. <coughs> Jesus Christ himself, who is the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple for the Lord, in whom you also are being built in together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Wow. Through the teaching of the Word, through the reading and the studying of the Word, you are being built into a holy temple, which is the dwelling place of God in your spirit. You see, your spirit, man, is made perfect. 
And by learning and teaching, uh, Sister Becky and, uh, and uh, her sidekick over there, number 11, they, they asked me this week, well, what's a good uh, uh, study Bible? And, of course, I have one that I recommended to them. I'm not trying to uh, uh, glorify anything or, or promote anything, but one that I like, and so I shared it with them. And uh, so they got one. And uh, Brent said yesterday, Brent said yesterday, number 11, he says, uh, Becky's at home studying the, studying the Bible. She, she won't put it down. She, she, you know, it's a good study guide. See, we have to study the Bible. We can't just read the Bible. Oh, well, I'm just going to wait and let Woody teach me. Well, what if Woody's wrong? <laughs> well, God will. But, but really, why are you trusting me? Scripture says over in the book of John, it says, and the Holy Spirit shall teach you all things I instruct him to teach you. So why not let the Holy Spirit teach you directly? That would be far more beneficial to you, I guarantee you. Far more beneficial. Now, that's not saying don't come to church, okay? That's not saying stay home and just study your Bible on Sunday morning between, uh, what, tell me, start 9 or 10? Between 10 and 10.30 or whatever it is, 11.30, 12, 1, 2. Pick it up and study it. Just study your Bible. Don't read it. Study it. It's far more important to study the Bible than it is to read it. Oh, I read the Bible one time, uh, the whole Bible in one year. Okay, what'd you learn? Well, I don't know. It doesn't matter, but I read the whole thing. Well, it does matter because if you don't get anything out of it, what good is it? And if you don't use what you get out of it, what good is it? Right? It's of no avail. So we need to understand that through the teaching of the word, through the learning of the word, through the studying of the word, through the preaching and the writings of God, we make God's home a more beautiful and holy place, which is in you, which is in you. All right, back to uh, John 17, verses 24 and 25. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am. So where's Jesus? Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven, in the third heaven, all right? So Jesus is not saying on this earth. He is saying when the time comes, they will be with me in heaven. They will be with me in heaven. It's exactly what he's saying. Now, he's not praying for his disciples now. This is you and me he's praying for. So don't, don't get this mixed up thinking that Jesus is just saying, oh, well, I want my disciples up here too. No, we're going to find out they're already there. This is you and me he's talking about here. Father, I desire that they also whom you have get, who you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. Well, if he loved Jesus before the foundation of the world, Scripture tells us that he also loved us before the foundation of the world and knew us before the foundation of the world was laid. You have been planned to be here at this particular time for this particular reason in your life. God knows every hair on your head, every freckle on your face. And he put it there. And you don't lose a hair on your head without him not seeing it fall. You don't lose a tear from your eye without him catching it in his hand. Because that's how much he loves you. He knows everything there is about you. Wouldn't it be a good idea to know him? Well, that's the reason that Jesus gave us, he came and gave us the word and the prophets and the writings so that we would know God. So that we will know God. Verse 25. Jesus continues. He says, O righteous Father. O righteous Father. The world has not known you, but I have known you. And these have known that you sent me. These have known. I have made it known to them. That I am from you and I came here for your purpose and your purpose alone. Here Jesus prays for our eternal salvation. Not that God would give it. 
because he will, but that we would receive it. But that we would receive it. This is not of the original disciples and apostles. This is directly for us, each and every one of us. Not for you here in Rock and Country Church today, but for all who believe from the disciples all the way to Christ coming back. That's a long, long, long time. But it is available to the, everyone who will believe during the church age which we are in. God sent Jesus into the world to do God's work, to make God known to the world. You can find that. Actually, let's go there. John 38, uh, John 6, I'm sorry. John 6, verse 38. John 6, verse 38. I have mine marked, so I'm cheating a little bit. <laughs> John 6 and 38. It says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is, I mean... <laughs> If you don't, if you highlight anything in your Bible, highlight, the, highlight these three verses. Underline them, circle them, however you need to do it, because you need to know these verses. Jesus came down from heaven, not to do his will, but to do the will of the Father who sent him. And this is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, should, but should raise them up in the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have the everlasting life, and I will raise them up in the last day. Wow, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. God sent Jesus here to save you and me through the New Testament, through the writing of the apostles and the disciples that he directed now, that does not exclude or nullify or do away with the Old Testament at all. Because the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So it is a complete Bible. It is all 66 books make it a complete testimony of Jesus Christ. God sent Jesus to do his will. Then Jesus sent out his disciples. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. The Great Commission. God sent Jesus. Jesus sent his disciples. Now, after his disciples, Jesus has called you and me. He has called you and me and everyone else who would believe to go. To go. Oh, well, I don't want to go to... Africa or India or China and start a new mission. That's not what he's saying. Go to your kids. Go to your grandkids. Go to your neighbor. Go to your back fence. Wherever you are, share the, the love of God with, with whomever, your neighbor. Who is your neighbor? Your neighbor is anybody other than you. That is your ministry. That is your mission field. Your mission field is wherever you're at. Share the love of God. What God has done for you, share it with someone else. You may or may not uh, convince them, if you will, but we're not there to convince them. We're not there to change them. We're, the, we're there to simply say, look, this is what God did for me, and the promise is he'll do it for you. God's the only one that saves, not us. God's the only one that changes, not us. God's the only one that calls people, not us. We just share Jesus. That's all we do. How hard is that, friends? It evidently is pretty doggone hard because we don't seem to do it enough. And I'm not pointing fingers at anybody in our congregations. I know y'all get out there with, with bell, cowbells and all this. Hey, 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 let me tell you about Jesus, y'all. No, I know you don't do that. But I do pray, and I do pray for y'all. Terry and I both, we pray for this church all the time. I do pray that you are sharing the gospel somehow, some way. Look, Jesus saves and he's the only one that saves. And if you want to be saved from eternal hell, fire, and damnation, guess what? Call on Jesus and he'll save you. His promise is he'll save you. Oh, but I got to do this. It don't matter. Oh, but I got to do this. It don't matter. Oh, well, I got to change this. It don't matter. But, 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 get your butts out of it. And just let God. Just let God because he will change it. Why? Because he's a loving God. 
Jesus' work is finished. His work was finished on the earth. John 19, uh, 30. John 19, 30. Jesus on the cross. It is finished. All right? He is seated at the right hand of the Father. His disciples' work was finished. In the New Testament, they are there seated on their thrones. Matthew 19 and 28. Matthew 19 and 28. He has given them thrones to sit on and, and rule over Israel. Now, what about us? Our work continues. Our work continues. And my kids' work is going to continue. My grandkids' work is going to continue. And on and on and on and on and on. Our work continues until Christ calls this church home. Then what's going to happen with that? Well, I'm glad you asked. Okay? Because he promises us to be glorified as well by receiving eternal salvation, number one, and reigning with Christ forever. Reigning with Christ forever. You are going to be put on a throne, if you will, of some sort in the kingdom of God. And you will reign with Christ. Well, where is that in the Bible? Well, I'm glad you asked. Go to 2 Timothy. You didn't think I knew, did you? Go to 2 Timothy, starting at uh, 2 Timothy 2, verse 10. 2 Timothy 2, verse 10. <clears throat> 2 Timothy 2, verse 10. Therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation. Amen. See, that's our, that's our purpose. That's our main purpose, is that the elect will see, receive salvation, which is in Christ Jesus. Which is in Christ Jesus. He didn't say that it's in Woody, and didn't say it's in Chris, didn't say that it's in Clark, it didn't say that it's, I keep leaving you ladies out, and I apologize for this. Uh, it, keeps, it, it doesn't say it's in Becky, it doesn't say it's in Margo, it doesn't say it's in Miss Rose. It, it simply says it is in Christ Jesus, in him alone. No other way. That's it. With eternal glory. So if you get Christ Jesus, you get eternal glory. Now, if you look at verses 11 through 13, this is called couplets. There are four couplets here, which means there are four different areas that we need to look at and try to explain in just these few verses. So the couplets are, for if we died in him, we shall live with him. Bam. That's a couplet. If we died with him, we shall live with him. In other words, if you died to self, you now live for Christ. Eternally, eternally. Second couplet. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. Now, some people may look at that and say, oh, if we endure, that means that if we don't lose our salvation. No, that's not what it is saying. What it says is, is that if we keep growing in Christ, we keep uh, manifesting God in us, we keep uh, uh, making it through, fighting the fight, running the race, Paul says. We cannot shrink back. We have to stand and stand firm. Now, this one may be uh, kind of hard to take. The third couplet. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we deny him, he will deny us. In other words, if we do not receive Jesus. See, this is the unforgivable sin. This is the only sin, the only one that is unforgivable. If you deny Jesus as Lord and Savior... At some point, you will stand before him. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. At some point, you will stand before him. And if you have denied Jesus as your Lord and your Savior in your lifetime, and it has to be in your lifetime that you have to accept him, in your lifetime, then he will say, away from me, you doer of iniquity. 
Not that you're a bad person. You can be a great, great person. But there's a lot of good people in hell. Why? Because they do not accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So you have to accept him as Lord and Savior. That is God's rule, whether you like it or not. You don't get to make the rules. Why? You ain't God. It's that simple. He says, if you deny me, I will deny you. He's not saying that, oh, well, you know, I don't know Jesus. That's not denying Jesus. That's just saying that you don't have the knowledge that you need. It's just saying that you don't know him yet. Why did Jesus come? Why are we here? To show the world Jesus, uh, God. To introduce God to the world. So that the world may know God. That's our purpose. That was Jesus' purpose. That's your purpose. It's my purpose. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we do not accept him, when it comes down to it, he will not accept us. You will go to hell. And then after that, you will go to the eternal lake of fire, different place. Hell and the eternal lake of fire is two different places. Hell is bad. The eternal lake of fire is worse. It's eternal. Verse 13, the fourth couplet. If we are faithless, he remains felt faithful because he cannot deny himself. He will remain faithful. Now, Jesus will never say, Woody, you're such a good guy. I'm just going to excuse you this time. No, there's judgment. We talked about this in our Wednesday night Bible study. Consequences of sin. There are consequences. You may suffer now. You may suffer later. But there are consequences for our sins. Now, we have grace. The New Testament. We're under grace. Oh, well, God will forgive me. God is faithful and he will forgive. But what if, if you read over, and we're studying the book of Romans, if you read over in Romans 1, starting at uh, verse 24 through 28, you will see that there can be or can come a time to where God literally takes his hands off of you, takes his hands of protection off of you, and leaves you to yourself. You want to do this? Then you go right ahead and do what you want to do. And you'll suffer the consequences. And they could be detrimental very detrimental to your, to your soul. God is always faithful and he cannot deny who he is and he is a holy and just God. He is a holy and just God. So God must judge sin. Now you can either be judged on your own merits. Anybody in here good enough to get into heaven by theirself? I hope you don't raise your hand. All right, Kenneth, you better not raise your hand over there, boy. <laughs> he was scratching his head. <laughs> because none of us are. None of us are. We cannot get into heaven on our own merits. We're not good enough. We can't be good enough. It's impossible. Romans 5.10 says that we are born, literally born, enemies of God. Whether we like it or not. We are enemies of God. So there has to be a change in our lives. And at some point in time, you have to make that change. It is up to you to make the change. God cannot deny himself. Jesus cannot deny himself. The Holy Spirit cannot deny himself. He will always be a holy and just God. And he will judge the, un the unrighteous. And he will also judge the righteous. So you can either be under grace or you can be under your own merits. It's up to you. I would prefer to be underneath the blood which is the grace of God. But that's up to you. Verse 26. I have declared to them your name. I have declared to them your name. And will declare it. Now, that's Jesus speaking, but what a profound statement if we said that. I will declare the name of God, the Father, and I will continue to declare it. In other words, nothing's going to make me stop doing what I do for God. Nothing. That the love with which you love me, Jesus saying the love of the Father, which he loved him, may be in them and I in them. 
Jesus declares that the father's uh, declares the father's name and his love for the whole world, the whole world. And through us, through us, his name and nature shall be made known to all who will believe. That is your ministry. Thereby being united with him in God's love, he remains with us and in us and we in him forever and ever to the glory of God the Father. Amen? Amen. Jesus prayed for you. He prayed that at some point in time, some point in time, you would say, yes, Jesus, yes. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. And if you have not done that, if you have not done that, and if you were, heaven forbid, but it happens. We had three people die in Kemp last week. Do you know that? Three people. A teacher, a student, and I don't remember the other one. Was it another student? Yeah, another student. Okay, it's all right. Two students and a teacher died. You don't know when you're going to die. Now, we kind of knew when Miss Sheila was going to pass. And she passed uh, Tuesday morning? Tuesday morning, 10, 1034, roughly. She passed away. Now, we knew, but we didn't know it was going to be Tuesday morning. Wednesday night, I mean, uh, Monday night, when the folks were with her, they didn't say, oh, well, you're going to be dead tomorrow morning. We didn't know that. She's been fighting cancer for some time. Doctors told us she was going to die a long time ago. We don't know. But we do know this. Other than Christ, other than Christ, and then there's two people mentioned in the Bible, other than Christ, everybody's going to die. I'm going to die. My wife's going to die. My kids and grandkids are going to pass it sometime, sometime. Hopefully after 120 years. That's what I plan on. But it's going to happen. I had a 1988, had a 18-year-old niece get, died in a single car car wreck. Or it wasn't a single car, but she was the only person killed. She didn't know she was going to die that day. But she did. You don't know when your time is up. But you do know, and I know, that someday it will be up. It'll be up. And after that, you don't get a do-overs. You don't get a mulligan. You don't get a second chance. You don't get a, oh, I didn't know. Romans 1 tells us God has made himself known to all of his creation. All of his creation. So we are without excuse. I think it's verse 20. Verse 20. So we don't have an excuse to not accept Christ. We don't have an excuse to stand before the Lord and say, nobody told me. Because God has told you. God has told you in your heart. Come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened and heavy laden, and I shall give you rest. Now that's not rest from the troubles of the world because remember over in... Uh, in uh, the earlier part of 17 there, when he was praying for his disciples, he says, I don't, I don't pray that you take them out of this world. Because if you took them out of the world, who in the world is going to preach the, the word to them? Who in the world is going to share the gospel to them? Who in the world is going to share Christ? So you need to leave them in the world. But I do pray that you protect them while they're in the world. Keep them in your righteous right hand. And that's exactly what God does. You say, well, how does he do that? Well, this is, how I, this is how I perceive it. I could die today. I could die tomorrow. I could die next week. But I'm ready to go. I know where I'm going, and I'm ready to go. God calls me home. Man, it'd be so much easier up there than it is here. I get to sit up there and sit on a cloud and play a harp and eat all of whatever the uh, grapes. No, no, not hardly. Not hardly. Actually, what we're going to do is whenever we get up to heaven, guess what we're going to do? We're going to work. We're going to do exactly what we do right now. Or what we should be doing, which is what he's been teaching us. Go out and make known God. That's what we're going to do. All right? I'm ready. 
I've been doing it for however long I've been doing it now, 17, 18 years, and I'm, I'm ready to continue doing it. The question is, are you ready? Okay, because your day may end today. I plan on living to be 120 years old. And I still plan on working for God. If Arthur and Idas would just leave me alone. I plan on working for God. Why? Because of the work he's done in me. Why would God save me? Paul says, what a wretched man I am. Why would God save me? Because he loves me. That's why. Because he loves me. And loves you just as much. So the question is, is how much do you love him? What are you going to do for him? What are you going to do to at least show a little bit of appreciation for what he's done for you? I pray that you will simply go out and share with somebody else what he's done for you. In hopes that they would come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And then you'll see them in heaven. My niece, I'm going to get to see her again. I'm going to get to see Sheila again. I'm going to get to see my mom again. My dad. Because I shared God, I shared God with them. That's it. I'm going to get to see, I'm going to, get to see you in, in heaven. Why? Because I shared God with you. Some of you. Some of you have already been saved all your life. Some of you might not yet be saved. I don't know. That's between you and God. But if you're not, your day could end today. Because you're not guaranteed tomorrow. Book of James chapter 4. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. You can plan all you want to. But when your time is up, it's up. But in my case, this is how I feel. This is how I interpret it. I am immortal. I am immortal. There ain't nothing going to take me out of this world until God says, I'm done with you. Then I get to go home. Then I get to go home. I pray you feel the same way. Let's pray. Father God, if anybody does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior today, Lord, I pray, I do, I do pray. If anybody watching on the internet, I pray, Lord, that if they don't know Jesus, I mean know Jesus, then they don't know God. Because that's what the Word says. He says, I and the Father are one. To know me is to know God. To know God is to know me. I pray that if there's anyone who does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that they will open up their heart because it's the Holy Spirit that is trying to reach their soul. Open up their heart and receive Jesus today. How do you do that? It's very simple. You have to truly mean it in your heart. But it's very simple. You just simply say, Dear Jesus, mean it in your heart though. Dear Jesus, I do not want you to deny me before the Father. So I do not deny you. I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. And I ask you to use me for the glory of God from this point forward. Come into my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. In your sweet name, Jesus, I ask. Amen.